Good afternoon, everyone. Sergeants, can you please start the recordings? Recording in progress. PC recording done. Chambers recording is rolling. All right, started. Good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Sightings and Dispositions. At this time, would council staff please turn on their video. Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. That is land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We are ready to begin. Good afternoon. I am Councilmember Kevin Riley, Chair of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Sightings, and Dispositions. I am very pleased to be joined in person for the first time as chair by my colleagues, Councilmember Kuhl, Councilmember Barron, and Councilmember Trigger. Today, we'll be hearing two designations of historic landmarks. We then expect to vote on these items and two accelerated UDAPs we heard at our meeting on June 15th. But before we begin, I want to say a few words about our hybrid hearing format and continuing COVID precautions. We are, together, we are together today in council chambers because the governor has lifted the COVID state of emergency, restoring the normal operations of the New York State Open Meetings Law. For members of the public who are comfortable attending in person, we have invited testimony to be presented here in chambers. Capacity here is very limited due to the social distancing protocols, but all who wish to testify will be heard. Mindful that many people are still more comfortable testifying remotely. We have also invited people to join us via, um, via Zooms. Member of the public who wish to testify via Zoom were asked to register for today's hearing. If you register to testify and are not yet signed into the Zoom, please sign in and remain signed in until, you're, until after you have testified. If you wish to testify remotely and have not registered, please go to www.council.nyc.gov slash land use. Once again, that's www.council.nyc.gov slash land, excuse me, slash land use to sign up now. Please do not sign into Zoom unless you plan to testify. You can watch the hearing on the New York City Council website. All people testifying remotely will be on mute until they are recognized to testify. Please confirm that your mic is unmuted before you begin speaking. Public testimony for all witnesses other than applicants will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have written testimony, you would like the subcommittee to consider in addition to or in lieu of appearing before the subcommittee, or if you require an accessible version of a presentation given at today's meeting, please email landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the land use number or project name in the subject line of the email. As with any meeting that involves a remote component, there, are many, there may be extended pauses if we encounter technical problems. We ask that you please be patient as we work through these issues. I now open today's public hearing on our first item. Land Use 820 is an application submitted by the Landmarks Preservation Commission pursuant to Section 3020 of the New York City Charter and Section 25-303 of the Administrative Code of the City of New York for the designation of Holy Rood Episcopal Church, Iglesia Santa Cruz, located at Manhattan Block 2176, Lot 30 as a historic landmark. The site is located in Council District represented by Council Member Rodriguez. Our first panel is Kate Lamos, Mikhail, and Anthony Fabry. Testifying on behalf of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, this panel will be testifying remotely. So I ask that these witnesses now be unmuted and the Council administer the affirmation. Can the applicants please raise their right hand and state their name for the record? Kate Lewis McHale. Anthony Fabry. 
to you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. You may begin your presentation. Thank you, Chair Riley, and good afternoon, um, subcommittee members. It's nice to see you back in your chambers. Hopefully our um, slideshow can be shared on the screen. Great, thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present the Holy Root Episcopal Church, Iglesia Santa Cruz, which was designated on May 18th, 2021 as an individual landmark. Next slide, please. Holy Root Episcopal Church, Iglesia Santa Cruz is architecturally significant as a sophisticated Gothic revival design by the architectural firm of Bannister and Shell and historically and culturally significant as an important social and religious anchor for the Washington Heights Latino community for the past 40 years. Built in 1911 to 16, the church has remained an important institution within the neighborhood, its congregation changing to reflect the influx of residents from the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, and other Spanish speaking places starting in the 1960s. By, night, by 2012, in recognition of its role to, in this community, the church changed its name to add the Spanish translation, becoming Holyrood Church Iglesia Santa Cruz. At the public hearing on March 23rd, three people spoke in support of designation, including Reverend Luis uh, Barrios, priest in charge of Holyrood Iglesia Santa Cruz, who has been um, a tremendous um, champion of designation and of all the humanitarian programs um, going on at the church. Um, and we also heard support from representatives of the New York Landmarks Conservancy and the Historic Districts Council. We had no testimony in opposition to designation and additionally received a letter of support from Manhattan Community Board 12. Next slide, please. Cited on the corner of West 179th Street and Fort Washington Avenue, the freestanding church is located directly across from the George Washington Bridge bus station and the landmark site consists of the entire tax lot. Next slide, please. As New York City's population um, increased dramatically in the late 19th century, the Episcopal Bishop Henry C. Potter encouraged the establishment of additional parishes within the diocese. Holyrood Parish was established in Upper Manhattan in 1893 by Reverend William O. Embury. In 1895, the congregation built its first church, pictured here on the left, um, in a, in a country-like setting on the corner of Broadway and 181st Street. In 1911, the congregation bought property on Fort Washington Avenue for the present-day church, which is shown on these maps um, with the kind of green triangle. Um, and the first service was held there in 1913 in the partially constructed sanctuary, which you can see in the 1913 map on the right. Next slide, please. Holyrood's new church was designed by Bannister and Shell, a firm that designed a broad range of buildings in New York City, including many religious properties. Completed in 1916 and dedicated in 1917, Holyrood Church became one of the most impressive and beautiful churches in the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Holyrood Church quickly gained a reputation for inclusiveness and humanitarian causes. In 1919, shortly after the new church was dedicated, the congregation welcomed Gustav Carsonson as its new rector, and he's shown it here. He had previously resigned from his former parish because it did not welcome black children um, from a nearby orphan asylum to worship at the church. Um, but at Holyrood, he was known in his day for very progressive and often came to support causes that were unpopular with some of his fellow clergy in the diocese. And as was noted in his 1941 obituary, under his leadership, Holyrood became one of the leading churches in Washington Heights. And its ministry and outreach programs continue to champion inclusiveness to this day. Uh, next slide, please. 
During the 20s and 30s, the neighborhood attracted a large number of Greeks, Irish, and Jewish people who settled there in increasing numbers, many escaping political turmoil in Europe. In the 1950s and 60s, the area began to attract a large population of Spanish-speaking people, um, with many coming from Puerto Rico and Cuba. By the 1980s, Dominicans became the dominant Spanish-speaking cultural group in northern Manhattan. Political changes beginning in the 1960s finally allowed people to leave the Dominican Republic after many years of repression. They settled in Washington Heights, um, where the cost of housing was more affordable and public transportation was available to where they worked. The Dominican Day Parade began in 1981 in Washington Heights, celebrating their culture and contributions to the city. And by 2000, the Latino population represented 75% of the population in Washington Heights and Inwood, with Dominicans making up the majority of those residents. In 2018, the neighborhood was officially honored as Little Dominican Republic. Next slide, please. In response to the growing Latino community in the neighborhood, in the 1960s, the Holyrood Parish started offering uh, Spanish language services. Additionally, the church has provided facilities for the Dominican Women's Development Center, an independent nonprofit that advances gender equality, social justice, education, and similar causes. Today, the parish has become actively involved in many humanitarian programs and is particularly known for its new sanctuary program, offering a safe haven and help for immigrants in need. The parish has also recently added services for the hearing impaired. The church just celebrated its 125th anniversary and has continued to serve as an anchor and resource to the residents of the predominantly Latino community. Uh, recently, the church included Iglesia Santa Cruz as part of its name to express its dual identity. The medieval English word holy rood and the Spanish Santa Cruz both translate to holy cross. Next slide, please. The architectural design of the church is a Gothic revival style that was often preferred by the Episcopal Church with its 19th century interest in English medieval architecture. The front facing gable terminates a tall nave with buttressed side aisles and, a clear, and clear story windows. Tall pinnacles frame the main window and extend far beyond the parapet, creating a striking appearance in the skyline. Articles written about the new building when it opened reported that its design was inspired by the Hereford Cathedral in England, which is shown here on the right. Uh, next slide, please. Dominating the entrance facade is an impressive tall arched stained glass window with delicate stone tracery. The filigreed Gothic details in terracotta at the front facade contrast dramatically with the more um, robust quarry-faced stone along the south facade. A narrow parking lot to the north of the building was originally intended to accommodate a small chapel that was never built. Minor alterations, including signage, replacement doors, um, window protectors covering historic windows and tracery, um, and the installation of ramps for universal access. Um, but today, uh, next slide, please. Holyrood Church Iglesia Santa Cruz is remarkably intact with excellent integrity of design and materials. This outstanding example of a Gothic revival church has served Washington Heights since its construction over a hundred years ago and continues to serve the diverse predominantly Latino community, offering services and programs in Spanish as well as English. During the past 40 years, it has expanded its community outreach and continues its tradition of humanitarian and culturally diverse programs. The Landmarks Preservation Commission recommends the City Council vote to uphold its designation. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. I just have one question. Uh, given the age of, of the building, the intricacy of its materials, including the stained glass windows, can you describe the current condition of the building and if the congregation may need to pay for any major restoration work going forward? If so, what technical and financial help is available to them? Sure, and that's a great question. This church actually has been going through a lot of um, renovations already. They have received grants from the New York Landmarks um, Conservancy They've done a lot of work um, to restore the roof, and they're currently doing some more work um, on the building envelope and also to make a space where they offer um, a food kitchen. Um, 
more available and they are working with our grants program um, for that as well. So the, the historic sites, uh, sorry, the now I'm forgetting the precise name of the grant, but the New York Landmarks Conservancy um, is an excellent uh, source for things like this. And, um, and our grant pro program, while smaller, and it would be limited to work that would be done on, a, that's, uh, on any part of the church that's not in religious use. Um, but we also, um, understanding the needs of churches is, is a really important part of how we work with them in our, in our many um, designated churches. We really understand that for churches, their main priority is often their mission. Um, and so keeping their buildings intact um, is something that we work with them very carefully and ha have a lot of expertise in our staff to give um, guidance through that. Okay, um, the, it's the Sacred Sites Fund. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Anthony. Um, before we move on, I just want to see if my colleagues have any questions. Okay. Thank you for your testimony on this item. Before we move on to the public testimony, I'm going to ask LPC to remain to, pre to be present for the next item. I now open the public hearing on LU 821 an application submitted by the Landmarks Preservation Commission pursuant to Section 3020 of the New York City Charter and Section 25-303 of the Administrative Code of the City of New York for the designation of the educational building located at 75th Avenue in the Manhattan as a historic landmark. The landmark site is located in the district represented by Speaker Johnson. Kate Lemos, Mikhail, and Andre Fabri will present on behalf of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. I remind them that you are still under oath and you may begin. Thank you very much, Chair Riley. Um, and I'll just start as the slides come back up. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present the Educational Building 75th Avenue in Manhattan, which was designated on May 18th, 2021 as an individual landmark. Next slide, please. The educational building, 75th Avenue, was constructed between 1912 and 1914, commissioned by George Arthur Plimpton, a successful book publisher and philanthropist. This 12-story office and loft building housed the National Office of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, as well as a remarkable group of tenant organizations that shaped American thought and society, including several that remain active and influential today. At the public hearing on May 23rd, on, excuse me, March 23rd, 15 people testified in favor of the designation, including representatives of the new school uh, who owns the property, speaker of the New York City Council, Corey Johnson, New York State Assembly member, Deborah Glick, State Senator Brad Hoyleman, Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer, Manhattan Community Board Two, the Armenian Bar Association, Historic Districts Council, J. Rosamond Johnson Foundation, the New York Landmarks Conservancy, Victorian Society of New York, and Village Preservation. No one spoke in opposition to designation. Some speakers also testified in support of further landmark designations in Union Square. And the commission also received more than 85 written submissions in support of the designation. Next slide, please. The educational building, 75th Avenue, occupies an L-shaped lot on the southwest corner of West 13th Street in Greenwich Village. The landmark site is its full tax lot shown here. Uh, next, please. The NAACP is one of the oldest and largest civil rights organizations in the United States. Founded in New York City in 1909, it sought to fight racism through legal and educational means. The National Office leased offices at 75th Avenue for almost 10 years, from February 1914 to June 1923. Initially located on the fifth floor, it moved to the sixth floor in 1919. This was an especially important chapter in the association's early development in history, during the post-reconstruction era, when racist Jim Crow laws and practices buttressed discrimination and segregation. The NAACP grew nationwide during this period and launched a series of effective campaigns against segregation, race discrimination, and mob violence, particularly the horrendous practice of lynching. 
which escalated following the revival of the Ku Klux Klan in the mid-1910s. The director of research and publicity, the prominent African-American sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois, seen in the, on the right here in his office at 75th Avenue, was a founder of the organization and editor of its influential journal, The Crisis. Next, please. Du Bois founded The Crisis in 1910 and was editor until 1934. This popular self-supporting magazine, which had a paid circulation of more than 100,000 by 1919, had offices in the building and continues to publish today. This influential publication contained monthly columns and news reports about NAACP's activities, as well as contributions from noteworthy artists and writers associated with the Harlem Renaissance. Next, please. In 1920 and 21, Du Bois and Augustus Granville Dill operated an independent publishing company, Du Bois and Dill, which published the Brownies book, the first magazine specifically written for young African-American readers. Du Bois wanted to be, them to be proud of their race and knowledgeable about their history and achievements. Published monthly, the pages were filled with positive imagery and stories by notable black authors. Langston Hughes, for instance, made his debut in the Brownies book in 1921. In various issues of the magazine, he contributed a poem, a play, a short story, and nonfiction pieces. Next. One of the most important figures in the national office was James Weldon Johnson. A former diplomat and skilled tactician, he organized the memorable silent march down Fifth Avenue in 1917 to protest violence against Black people in St. Louis and Memphis. And as field secretary, oversaw the establishment of hundreds of new local branches including many in Southern states. In 1920, he was appointed executive secretary, making him the first African-American to lead the NAACP. Next, please. Under Johnson's leadership, the Dyer Bill to make lynching a federal crime was passed by the US House of Representatives in 1922, but was blocked by a filibuster in the Senate. Though nearly a century would pass before a similar law would finally win passage, the NAACP's campaign played an important role in confronting the issue and raising the association's national profile. The NAACP and the Crisis Magazine moved to 69 Fifth Avenue at the northeast corner of 14th Street in July of 1923. That building, which is um, shown in this photograph, um, was later demolished and it was the location of the NAACP office when it hung the now famous banner, a man was lynched yesterday from a window in 1936 as part of the organization's continued campaign against the atrocity of lynching. And 75th Avenue is visible in this photograph to the south, just below that green arrow. Uh, next, please. In the years leading up to World War I, the educational building attracted a great number of peace advocates, so many that newspapers called it the Peace Building. Plimpton, the building's owner, was a trustee in the World Peace Foundation and the Church Peace Union, now the Carnegie Council, which was active at 75th Avenue for several decades. He also provided office space at no charge to the New York branch of the Women's Peace Party, founded in 1915 by suffragists Jane Addams and Carrie Chapman Catt. Tenants with similar interests included the American Neutral Conference Committee, the League to Enforce Peace, the New York Peace Society, and the Emergency Peace Federation. Another noteworthy group associated with the building was the American Committee for Armenian and Syrian Relief, now called the Near East Foundation. Next, please. The American Civil Liberties Union also traces its beginnings to the educational building. Initially called the National Civil Liberties Bureau, it was founded in New York by the American Union Against Militarism, which was a pacifist group headed by Lillian Walls and Crystal Eastman, um, and evicted following raids by the Justice Department in 1918, it was soon relaunched as the ACLU. Today, this organization, of course, has offices in every state and more than a million members. Next, please. Another notable tenant was the National Board of Review, founded in 1909. For several decades, all films that gained its approval were accompanied by the screen label passed by the National Board of Review. This organization also sponsored publications devoted to film criticism, um, such as shown here, 
um, films in review is, is now um, still in print and is the oldest periodical of its kind in the United States. Next, please. The Plimpton family sold 75th Avenue in 1946. Um, in subsequent years, it had several owners, including the educational publisher Prentice Hall and real estate developer Jack Browse. Uh, next, please. The building's architect was Charles A. Rich, formerly of the noted firm Lamb and Rich. Um, and it's an understated example of the Beaux-Arts style. The white brick and possibly cast stone elevations display a tripartite configuration consisting of a three-story base, an eight-story midsection, and a two-story crown. Most of the original neoclassical ornament is well-preserved, including the door surrounds, pilasters, composite capitals, relief panels, keystones, rounded pediments, and an extensive terracotta cornice. Next, please. In reference to Plimpton's publishing company and the various educational tenants, the door surrounds that face West 13th Street display cartouches that frame small images of open books, while some bays on the uppermost floors have iron grills with gilded book reliefs. Next, please. The New School for Social Research acquired 75th Avenue in 1972, a significant institution with close associations to Greenwich Village. It was founded in 1919 as a progressive center for adult education and now incorporates five colleges. The building was sensitively renovated in 2005 to six and is currently part of the Sheila C. Johnson Design Center at the Parsons School of Design slash the New School. And the award-winning renovation um, that is pictured here modified the show windows on the first floor and enlarged the West 13th Street entrance. Um, next, please. The well-preserved educational building is historically significant as the former national office of the NAACP in the early 20th century, as well as the many significant organizations that advance social justice and equality a legacy carried on for almost 50 years by the new school. Um, we're very glad to have their support for designation and the Landmarks Preservation Commission recommends the city council vote to uphold this designation. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. This building is a prime example of the power of individual landmarks. It is beautiful, art art architecturally significant, and perhaps most importantly, historically significant to the city and the country as a whole. At over 100 years old, can you explain why only now this designation is being considered? That is a good question. Um, and, and we were asked through our designation process as well. Um, and I think um, it is an incredibly significant building in terms of its history. Um, I think maybe at first it, it hadn't stand, stood out as much for its architecture. Um, but it is a very handsome Beaux-Arts style building. And as we expanded our research, we are very grateful to Village Preservation and the many advocates that sent us letters about it and helped reveal its history. And as we did more research as well to, to really uncover the depth of the um, significance in this building, it, it is really important to have designated and we're, we're really pleased to be here today. Thank you, Kate. I uh, would like to see if my colleagues have any questions. Okay. There being no more council member questions, this panel is now excused. Thank you. Thank you both. We will now vote to approve the two individual landmarks that we heard and the two accelerated UDAPs we heard at our June 15th meeting. In addition to these landmark designations, we will vote to approve pre-considered land use 813, the TBK 1002, Riseboro UDAP, and Article 11, excuse me, and R11. This application was submitted by HPD pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law requesting approval of an Urban Development Action Area Project, waiver of the area designation requirements and the requirement of Sections 197-C 
and 197-D of the New York City Charter and approval of a real property tax exemption for property located at 135 Manahan Street, Block 3306, Lot 53, in the Brooklyn Council District, represented by Councilmember Dharma Diaz. These actions will facilitate the rehabilitation of a vacant six-unit building for rental to families with annual household incomes up to 120% of AMI, with rent set at 60% of AMI. We will also vote to approve pre-considered land use application 814, the TBX 1002, MPD, UDAP, and Article 11 tax exemption. This application was also submitted by HPD pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law, Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law, requesting approval of an Urban Development Action Area Project. Waiver of this area designation requirements and the requirements of Section 197-C and 197-D of the New York City Charter and approval of the real property tax exemption for properties located at 970 Anderson Block, I'm excuse me, Anderson Block 2504, Lot 70, and 1105 Tinton Ave, Block 22661, Lot 52, Borough of the Bronx. The properties are located in the council districts represented by Council Member Gibson and Council Member Ayala. Council, please call the roll. Uh, Chair, before we call the vote, um, I'm just waiting to confirm that no one signed up to testify for the landmarks items. And um, maybe the meeting can stand at ease while we check. And then we can close the hearing, and I'll, then I will call the vote. Okay. Are there any more members of the public who wish to testify on LU 820 and or 821? Seeing now that the public hearings on LU 820 and LU 821 are now closed. Thank you, Chair. Just to continue on with the vote, for a vote on land use items 813, 814, and what we heard today, um, 820 and 821, but um, sorry, Chair, we were pausing to confirm. No problem. All right, proceeding with the vote, since no one signed up to testify on the public hearing items. Again, for land use items 813, 814, 820, and 821. Chair Riley. I don't know. Council Member Koo. I don't know. Council Member Barron. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Thank you. Uh, voting yes on land use 820 and 821 the land walking uh, items and i am voting no on lu 813 and 814. Uh, i've listened to the hearing that we had previously on those items and i note that there are no designated income bands for the eligibility to apply it says up to 120 percent which is rather high in the areas where these uh, projects are located, and it does not have designated um, a number of apartments at each of those income bands that would be below 120. And also for LU 814, there's still an open issue as to the number of units that would be able to be co-op units. I think it's a question, as I read, that they would be offered, but there's not a definitive number yet. And I also recall that when I asked them about an elevator in that uh, the response that came back was that 
It's cost prohibitive. It would be $1.3 million for an elevator. And I think that in the 21st century, in 2021, when we're talking about increasing accessibility and providing affordable housing, there needs to be a way to make sure that a six-story walk-up can include an elevator, and it's not being done in this project. Thank you. Council Member Traeger. Vote aye. Lil use 820, 821, 813, and 814 are approved and recommended to the Land Use Committee. And the final vote is for 820 and 821, four in the affirmative, no negative, no abstentions, and for 813 and 814, three in the affirmative, one negative, and no abstentions. That concludes today's business. I remind you that if you have written testimony on today's items, you may submit it to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the land use number or the project name in the subject heading. I would like to thank applicants, members of the public, my colleagues, subcommittee council, land use staff, and the Sergeant at Arms for participating in today's hearing. This meeting is hereby adjourned.